Hello and welcome to episode 28, maybe 29, maybe 30 of Sofa Sensei's. You're joined by me, Caban, and this is the Aki and Saltfish Digital Network. Listen, what a weekend, what a moment in combat sports. John Jones is the heavyweight champion of the world. Valentina Shevchenko is no longer the flyweight champion of the world. That title now goes to Alexa Grasso. I'm still buzzing. John Jones is the heavyweight champion of the world. Listen, moment, moment in time. The GOAT, John Jones is that guy. And we're gonna discuss that and many more things exclusively today on Sofa Sensei's Sunday Sit Down Live. Right, not gonna lie, full disclosure right away. I got the, I got c- carried away there right at the end and said live. This is not live, obviously. But it wouldn't matter if it was because we don't edit our stuff over here. This is raw, uncut, all those favorite IFL TV uh, buzzwords. So anyway, <sighs> where, where to begin? Where to begin? I'm not gonna start with John Jones becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. That is, of course, the main event of the reason why we're here today. So I'll I'll go to that at some point later on in the show. But first of all, this is the Sunday sit down on Surfer Sensei's. And we do this show to recap the week in combat sports and what a week it's been. So let me just run down a few things that have happened this week. Um, we've seen more Conor Ben statements. Uh, and to be honest with you, I'm going to be real upfront right here, right now. Um, we're not going to go over much Conor Ben stuff, if any. I think we're going to glance over maybe him fighting Pacquiao, but that's about it. Um, we're not going to talk about his statement and his uh, other statement in relation to the WBC. Um, there's been so many other podcasts made on that topic. I'd encourage you to go and check out those. Specifically, um, Boxing News podcast is really good with things like this. Um, I've got a bit of Conor Ben fatigue, I won't lie, and I'd imagine some of you viewers and some of you fellow Sofa Sensei's have also got Conor Ben fatigue. Um, one might even say you're exhausted. Um, if you caught that one there, write in the comments. Um, so yeah, I just want to sort of move on from Conor Ben. So we'll, we'll leave that one there um, with Conor Ben fatigue. Uh, so moving on then, in terms of what's been happening over the last week or so, obviously last week we saw, uh, well, around this time last week, we saw Tommy Fury fight and defeat uh, Jake Paul. Um, and, you know, in the lead up to that fight, they had a bet which um, involved the contract, which wasn't signed regarding double or quits in terms of the purse. So, i.e., if Tommy loses, um, he has to give all his purse to, to Jake. And if Jake loses, then Jake would double Tommy's purse. If you believe the reports online, Jake made about 25 million. And um, what's his name? Tommy made seven. So that would have brought Tommy's total purse if that bet had gone through. To about 14 mil, which isn't a bad day at work at all. Um, but you might remember when that proposition was made by Jake, John stepped up and he um, said, deal. And Tommy Fury looked back like, what? He was definitely not 100% in on that bet. And I think that is revealed by the fact that he didn't end up signing the contract associated with said bet. Anyway, since then, Tommy Fury's dad again, John Fury, has come on Twitter and basically said, Jake, be a man of your word. Um, give me, or give Tommy rather, the um, the money that you said you're, g- you're going to give him. Uh, and then Tommy went on to GMB, Good Morning Britain, uh, and demanded the money again, same way. And said, you know, man of your word. We shook hands. We don't do contracts, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Um, there's a lot to pick up there, really. Um, it's... It just seems a little bit desperate. At the end of the day, you won the fight, and I suppose this is another way to sort of lengthen out the feud, make the rematch a little bit more appealing, um, and make more money. I, I understand that, but it's also a little bit embarrassing. You know, you, John, in particular, you're like a 55-year-old man uh, begging a 25-year-old f- for extra money. It, it just comes across a little bit desperate. Um, so what are we saying here as Sofa Sensei's? Listen, you didn't sign the contract. You didn't want to take that risk. And that's okay. That's really okay. I think a lot of us here understand it. Um, Seven million pounds is a lot to risk. So you didn't. And in that case, move on. 
yeah prepare for the fight maybe it's a little angle to pull and, and, and shit talk a little bit but it's it's boring it's jarring um the fight wasn't even like a domination by tommy so if it was the fact that tommy dominated jake then maybe you'd have this 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 lever to pull a little bit more and you could make a bit of an interesting thing out of it but actually the fight was relatively close um just get on with training for the rematch if, 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 if indeed the rematch is next. And if it isn't next, figure out what your next move is and capitalise on that. This isn't the right way to go, in my opinion. It just is a bit boring. And not going to lie, in this cost of living crisis, arguing over 7 million or not is, is sort of alienating to, to members of the public. Yeah, a bit boring. Move on. Anyway, that's what's been happening. And I, I think, again, it, I, I slipped up early and I said um, about John. And actually, I think it was a bit of a Freudian slip because I think John slightly lives through um tommy which you know let us know your thoughts on that one below uh drop it in the comments and let us know what you think um right like i said we're not going to cover conor ben so we'll move on from that one that's on my list uh darren till was released from the ufc earlier in the week uh that cropped up on ufc roster watch and uh, that was quite a shock actually when people saw that because what why is darren till being released obviously he's not been he's not had the best um run as of recently i think he's lost five of his last six um and to be honest with you, it makes a lot of sense. However, Darren Till is a big star. So it was a big, big shock for those that are invested in the UFC, and particularly UFC in the UK. Um, since then, Darren Till has come out and said he actually asked for his release. It was a mutual uh, decision. Well, not mutual, because he asked for it on his side and the UFC obliged. Um, he said he wants to come back in two years. He's battling a lot of injuries. Um and he, he said a few interesting things with, with Brett, Otto, Otto, Brett Okamoto. Um, he was talking about how he doesn't understand how these guys um, are stronger than him, are bigger than him, are not as injured than him, or even those that are as injured as him can keep going because he trains really hard, he works really hard, and he just can't keep up. He doesn't understand. Are they on something? Was, was some of the questions he was raising. And um, in a lot of ways, Darren Till... One of the comments said, Darren Till is so full of himself. He sees himself as the hardest worker in the room. He sees himself as someone who cannot be outworked, who, who does the most. And that might be part of his problem in that he's doing too much. If you go into fight week and you go into the, to the fight itself and you have no power in your legs or you say you're knocking people out and sparring, but you're not, that doesn't translate over into the, the fight. As much as that may be mental, it might also be physical in the fact that you've spent all your good, good energy in the gym. You know, these guys don't train as hard as you. And that might be a good thing, bro, because they're not walking around damaged goods. He said his vision is to take two years out and come back to the UFC. Obviously, recently we saw McGregor take uh, more or less a year out after breaking his leg um, against Poirier. And he, he didn't openly say this, but he more or less admitted to taking steroids to heal his body, uh, which is completely understandable in a lot of ways because of the nature of the injury and the nature of steroids. So it helps w with recovery in that respect. Um, Darren hasn't had any t uh, surgery on his on his knees, which he says is, is, is predominantly ACL problems, but generally they're beat up. Um, so maybe that's an option for him. I think he's going to go for stem cells and, and maybe some, some, some uh, secret juice, if you will, um, on the side as well. He wants three fights this year outside of MMA, MMA but with inside the, the combat arena, uh, specifically pertaining to striking. So... I guess boxing, celebrity boxing, YouTuber boxing, misfits, those that sort of avenue. Um, I can't lie. I feel like some of the star of Darren Till has, has faded a little bit because of those uh, performances. He's, he's still a name. He's still a great talker. But is he someone that you'd clamor to watch? I don't know. I don't know. Um, it draws some parallels to who we saw last night in Cody Garbrandt, but I'll go over the card later, so you know, bear with me. But yeah, I don't know. What are your thoughts on Darren Till? For me, um, the vision to come back in two years is wishful thinking. Um, even Hunter Campbell told him when he granted that, that release, Hunter Campbell is the legal, um, the chief legal officer or whatever at the UFC, um, we're not in a habit of re-signing fighters. Um, that being said, Kevin Lee did get re-signed recently, and he's he had a fairly disappointing run in the UFC towards the end, so anything can happen. Uh, and Darren Till certainly has more star power than than than, than uh, Kevin Lee, or star power, I should say. Um, so, yeah, I, I, 
I just, I'm just not interested in in Darren Till at this point. I don't think he's as good as he thinks he is, um, and I think he's shown that. I think he he got exposed in a lot of ways by Tyron Woodley. Um, the Masvidal fight was 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 unlucky, but obviously Masvidal still did what he had to do. He's still good, still great. Um, and since then, his move into middleweight has been lackluster. He's talked a really really good game and just hasn't backed it up. Now he says he has the potential to be this great. We we haven't seen it. So, I don't know. I don't want to be too harsh, right? I don't want to kick a man while he's down and all of that. So, I wish him the best. And I wish him, I hope he does come back fully recovered and fully ready to go and fully to uh, able to embrace his potential. But mm, I'm not sure I am convinced personally. Let's just go over some of his, his last few performances then briefly. Um, so, obviously, he went on that run, didn't he, where, where um, he fought Nick Dalby, Jessin Ayari. Bo Bojan something, uh, Donald Cerrone obviously is, is the standout performance in all of that run, and then he, in my opinion, controversially beat Stephen Thompson, um, in Liverpool after missing weight. Then he got put into a tighter fight with Tyron Woodley and got submitted in round two. Then he lost to George Masvidal via vicious knockout in London, uh, round two. That's the same night George gave uh, Leon three piece and soda. Uh, and then he fought Kelvin Gasolum, split decision, although I thought Darren Till did win that. And then he, he lost three fights in a row to Robert, Robert Whittaker. Decent performance. Derek Brunson, terrible performance. And Drickus Duplessis, again, terrible performance from, uh, what's his name? Darren Till. So, yeah, I don't know. It's <laughs> it doesn't excite me. I don't... <laughs> It's it's a thing. It's a it's a a major thing in the UFC, particularly British MMA. But Darren Till, I think, has peaked, and I think he's had his time. I'll move on. Right. Next up in in the list is uh right. So we saw um cruiserweight world champ or former unified cruiserweight world champ. Anyway, uh, Murat Gassiev returned to heavyweight yesterday in uh I want to say Russia. I don't think it was Russia though, because obviously everything that's going on. I think it was Russia. Anyway, uh, Gassiev returned in his heavyweight um, performance to fight some random guy. Uh, I think he had 20 and one record, so on paper he was a good good test. But it seems like it was a fix. Um, now I'm gonna just have to say allegedly there for legal reasons. Obviously, allegedly a fix, um, but a very suspicious win. Gassiev, Gassiev motions to for the guy to move his arm, then he throws a seemingly innocuous body shot, and then the guy goes down can't get up for the 10 count as soon as the 10 counts over springs right up and, and and they embrace um a little bit fishy a little bit suspicious again i don't see the point in fights like this because gassiev isn't a name um, and, and his opponent wasn't a name either so you need to be in these competitive fights with with you know relatively good names so that you can get the anthony joshua's you can get the uh, maybe the usic rematch because um obviously he got picked off by usic um you might even want to fight marius bradis those sorts of fights there. Obviously, Marius is a cruiserweight still, but he might want to move up. There's a few fights there available for Gassiev um, in the mix of like Zhang, um, Bacoli, all those sorts of fights. Tony Yoka, those sorts of fights where, where there are names over here and, and being a name over here generates money. So, yeah, a few interesting things for him to do, but I don't know. I think he's kind of blew it there, actually. That that, that isn't good for his reputation. Um, I didn't even know about the fight until Robert Tebbit put it on his Twitter. So, yeah, not le not greatly promoted either. Um, it's just a shame to see boxing still in these sort of um, scandals again. You know, boxing lets itself down, particularly when we put it in contrast to the big major UFC cards we see week on, week in, week out. Um, okay, so in terms of boxing, I think one other thing to note is obviously Misfits. Uh, they had their thing. It was tag team boxing. Looked apparently quite interesting. I didn't actually get to see any of it other than clips. Um yeah, I don't really tend to talk about that one too much. Uh, it is what it is. It's 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 it seems to be a growing market, a growing demographic as well in terms of that that teenager sort of social media fan uh, market. It's growing. They're doing their thing. Wish them the best. I think it's propping up the zone a lot more than the maximum cards are. So that's an interesting dynamic that did cross my mind yesterday. Obviously, the zone said they wanted to invest in, in in that top tier of boxing, but boxing has its own problems, and they seem to be uh, now shifting. Uh, paths to go ahead and well 
prop up that influencer market in order to make the most money. So tells you all about the zone's long term strategy. Talking of business long term strategy, BT is obviously owned by Discovery now and um, they are changing their name to TNT Sports, which is a shit name for a BT Sports personally. But yeah, TNT Sports is going to be rebranded. My questions are, I wonder what that does to the price, first of all. And second of all, I wonder what that does to the personnel within BT. BT Sports UFC team is some of the best uh, teams that present UFC in the world. You know, some of their promos that they produce, some of the posters they make, uh, the social media content, the, the, the fight week content is some of the best. Um, so it would be a shame to see that get shaken up too much, but it would be interesting to see what direction they take. Their boxing side of things definitely needs a shake up. Right now it is, is pretty much dominated by Frank Warren's office. So it would be nice to see that change a little bit. Um, other than that, yeah, we'll see. There's lots of things to, to wait and see, really, I suppose, on that one. Okay, so moving on from BT and, and those sorts of uh, misfit things, the last thing to mention, um, or the last two things to mention, um, is, of course, uh, O'Hara Davis returned last night in Newcastle fighting uh, Lewis Ritson for some sort of um, world title eliminator. Uh, he ended up beating Lewis Ritson in round six or, sorry, seven or eight uh, by body shot broke a few ribs by the looks of things. Lewis Richardson generally couldn't get up, sorry, genuinely couldn't get up. Um, and then, uh, yeah, now O'Hara is that guy. He is facing Rolly Romero for some sort of world title shot, hopefully, or, or at least an eliminator again, a final elim eliminator this time. That's a big fight. That's an interesting fight, actually. Um, even Josh Taylor, the person who O'Hara had a major uh, rivalry with, congratulated him on Twitter. They said, you know what? Decent shot from you, so well done. And it's good to see them some them wrap up their their rivalry. Josh Taylor's going through it right now in terms of the tra trajectory of his career. Ever since he lost but didn't officially lose to Jack Cattrall, his public image has been going through it a lot. So um, good to see him sort of repair those bonds with with O'Hara because O'Hara, I feel, is a is a decent guy. Um, in a lot of ways, I feel like he got done over a little bit in the way that he got dropped from Matchroom and, and that whole fiasco and I'm glad to see him still be able to clock in those big performances and show up when he needs to. Um, on that subject, Lewis Ritson for me needs to call it a day now. Um, he's had a bit of a weird career ever since he left Matchroom, was signed by I think MTK, then Probellum and whatever else now and um, yeah, he just hasn't had the, the best of luck really um, and judging by the arena yesterday in Newcastle, he also hasn't been able to captivate the Newcastle fans like he once previously was. So it probably is time for him to hang it up, for if, if, if for nothing else, for his health. So, yeah, all the best to him and his family uh, moving forward. Good luck. All right, the other thing to mention in boxing is going back to Tommy and, and, and Jake, um, and particularly money and all those sorts of things as well, they sold 775 pay-per-views. That's official, by the way. Officially sold that, so that's mental. Um, congratulations to those guys because that fight obviously captivated a large audience. And 775 in boxing is no joke of a pay-per-view. That's a massive audience. A paying audience as well. I know in the UK uh, that was £20, but uh, elsewhere it would have been more. But let's just say, for the sake of argument, uh, £20 times... 775,000, that's 15 and a half million um, pounds. And obviously, like I said, it was more than that um, in other territories. So, yeah, props to the guys. Well done. Uh, they did what they had to do. That's what boxing is all about, really. That's what sport is all about. You know, you, get, you garner interest, you sell that interest, or you monetize that interest, and then you, you make money. So, yeah, good on them. Um, all right. For me, this is what I've been coming here to talk about, really. The UFC. The U Ultimate F Fighting C Championship. Let's go. What a night. What a night. You can see I'm on my phone right now. I'm just trying to find the running order so I can discuss it a little bit more. Right, so um, I woke up about 20 past 2 in the morning. Uh, wasn't able to catch the whole card. I caught the end of Derek Brunson versus the Plessis. And then every fight since then, pretty much, uh, although not all of them. I'll, I'll explain that later. Um, right, so going through the card briefly in terms of anything that stands out before those fights. Um, 
Tabitha Ritchie um, beat Raquel Penne, so that was a good a good performance there from her. Uh, she always shows up. Ian Gary, oh yeah, he was a good one. Uh, he got dropped in the and I think I think round one or two uh, by a check left hook, and then he, he literally learned on the job um, to defend that. So the second time he threw that same shot that got him countered before, he pulled back, dodged the left hook, and uh, did what he had to do. In the end, he ended, he ended up stopping his um, his opponent Keenan Song um, pretty viciously. Uh, you can see all his eye eye after the fight; it was it was pretty much sore and shut. So Ian Gary did what he had to do, and throughout the lead up to that as well, I was wondering how Ian Gary would perform because he's he's recently married, um, he's recently had a kid. He met McGregor in, in the build up to this fight week as well, and that was a a big thing for him. Um, so I was wondering how he was going to deal with all of those uh, competing pressures. You know, having a child always changes a fighter, or, or sorry, mostly changes fighters. So it was I was very intrigued to see how he'd show up, and by all accounts. He did his thing, you know, he's still a prospect, he's still growing, and he showed up how he had to, so well done to him. Um, didn't see Marquez versus Barrio, so I can't comment on that one. Didn't see Ariulo versus Ribas, so I can't comment on that one. I caught the end of Brunson, Derek Brunson versus Drekus Duplessis. Um, how do I put this? For me, it wasn't an impressive fight. Um, both guys looked incredibly, incredibly laboured, slow and tired by the time the third round came on. Now, obviously, if you listen back to, um, I think, two weeks ago on Sofa Sensei Sunday Sit Down, uh, Rochelle and I acknowledged that we went to boxing recently and we were fucked. <laughs> no easy way to put it. It was fucking difficult. It was challenging um, and, and it really tests you. It doesn't matter how much you've trained or not. It really tests you. So, um, you know, in a lot of ways, I feel a lot more empathetic towards their tiredness, but they're professional athletes. They've been doing this for a long time. They should know better. They should perform better, particularly when they they have designs of, of challenges for some sort of title in the division because, you know, if you look at the top top three, four, five of that division, they've got a decent gas, gas, can, gas tank. So let's, let's just check that. UFC middleweight rankings. First, th obviously, you've got the champ, Alex Pereira, then you've got Israel, Robert Whittaker, and Jared Cannonier, Marvin Vittori. Those are the top four, and then fifth is Derek Brunson, apparently. Now, <laughs> Israel's got a great gas tank. He's done five rounds many times. Robert Whittaker, exactly the same. Jared Cannonier fades at times, but but generally speaking, can put it together. And Ma Marvin Vittori, again, proven gas tank. So, you know, for Derek Brunson and, and Drukas to, to be that laboured and that tired is a little bit disappointing. Um, I don't think Drickus is that good. He he's, he's keeps talking about how he's going to be a champion and all of that. I just don't see it personally. Uh, Derek Brunson, I feel, should wrap it up now. He's been um, in a couple vicious fights recently. His, his corners have to throw in the towel. I think in his both his last two fights, he had that, that run as blonde Brunson where he was putting on a great run, and that was great. But I think I think he's like 40 as well, or 38 at least. So it, it's time to sort of wrap it up, I, I feel, um, just for the sake of his own health as well. Some of the shots he was taking, particularly towards the end of last night, just weren't nice to see. Head bouncing off the canvas, violent right hands to the chin. Mm. Don't know. It's not nice. Nothing really to say other than that on that fight. Moving on, we saw Garbrandt versus um, Jones. Um, I think as a viewer, I was very nervous. I've never heard of Jones before. As a viewer, I was very nervous of, uh, of watching a Garbrandt fight again because obviously Garbrandt has been on a skid as of recently. Um stoppage losses and etc. Ever since he won that title from Dominic Cruz, he just hasn't been able to reach that same level of calibre again. He lost twice in a row to TJ TJ Dillashaw, Dillashaw sorry, and then got knocked out by Pedro Munoz. So um Kobe typically is a sorry, Cody typically is a hothead who um the reason I'm I'm messing my words by the way is because I'm really tired. Um but I was awake from two thirty to six thirty and I just haven't really slept much. So my brain's a bit fried. But yeah, the reason um, Cody lost all those fights is because of his hot head. Um, he seemed to have got that under control last night, but then again, uh, <laughs> his opponent wasn't really pressing the action or didn't really press any action until like the third round. Um, and in which case, then Cody, Cody did look a tiny bit vulnerable. And um, that, of course, makes for interesting viewing, but I'd, I'd, uh, thinking about his future uh, with a calculated performance like that again. Cody has some way to go. I just don't see him reaching the top of the division again because when they're way more aggressive and when they stick it on him, I think he comes unstuck. And I think he can't he can't handle being a, a, a nail, 
as much as he can handle being a hammer. So, yeah, um, I'm glad he got the win, though. You know, I think it's good for his mental health in a lot of ways that he got that win. Obviously, last time out, he went down to 125. You know, a silly, a silly decision in a lot of ways because not only is he, um, you know, depleting his brain of, 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 of fluids, which we've spoken about a lot on this show in terms of uh, the damage that the fighters take and, and, and how dehydration plays a huge role in that. Uh, if you want any more information, make sure you check out Tris Dixon's book called Damage. Um, but additionally, when you're a 135 fighter, going down and cutting 10 pounds to 125 is a massive percentage of your body weight. Uh, versus, you know, if John Jones now was to go down to uh, light heavyweight or whatever, because he's been there, he's experienced in there, and it wouldn't be a massive percentage of his natural body weight, because obviously he's now a bit bloated and, and bloomed. Yeah, interesting, very interesting. But but Cody, he got the win. That's that's the mo- that's the most important thing really, and he, d- he didn't get hurt in the process or majorly hurt anyway. So glad to see that. Right next up, we saw uh, the debut on the UFC of Nick uh, Bo Nickel versus, I want to say his name, Jordan Pickett. Um, yeah, Bo did what he had to do. I, you know, in, in his Dana White Contender Series performances, I think he had two performances there and they all lasted less than two minutes. So, extrapolate that out. Um, one of two things to mention there is that one, Bo looked quite small in comparison. So I wonder if there's any scope there to move down. I don't know. Uh, secondly, um, he tried to throw a kick in the first couple seconds and slipped on the on the on the mat, but it just looked a bit clunky, looked a bit shit. Uh, and three, uh, it took him a little while to get that choke in and, and get the tap. So interesting to watch. He's obviously called out Kamza and all of them people there. Uh, obviously, it's his debut, so he's got a long time, to, got a long way to go. It'll be interesting to see how the UFC match him. Um, in a lot of ways, uh, it makes you th- feel that sometimes maybe they signed him a little bit early. But again, he garners a lot of hype. He's on the main card. He opened up the main card. They're trying to raise his profile. They'll make a lot of money out of him. He's an N- NCAA uh, champion in, in wrestling. And wrestling is huge in America, so he'll have a profile anyway. And they're just capitalizing and weaponizing that to make money. So, yeah, by all means, it's a business move, and he's good. So more more power to him, and good luck to him. We'll see what he does next. But interestingly, actually, one thing to break mention is that he, he's not in a rush to come back. He said, he, he, you know, after that short performance in itself, he's got a lot of things to work on in the gym. He's got a lot of ways he wants to develop, which is great. It's great to see that in a, in a, in a combat athlete. Um, but it's also great to see that he's not eager to, to, to jump in there and, and, and defeat more tomato cans, if I can be frank. Uh, he wants to really work on his skills, hone his skills, and then challenge some top guys within that division. So it's, great, it's good to see uh, he's got a strategy in place and, and division as well, wha- where he wants to go. Next, we saw Jalen Turner versus Mateusz Gamrot, or Mateusz Gamrot, uh, a Polish fighter who took the fight on 10 days' notice. Um, I'm not that impressed by Gamrot. He, 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 he's fundamentally sound in terms of his takedowns. He's a vessel heavily. He's a wrestle heavy fighter um he did what he had to do got Jalen down landed a couple strikes won on a split decision um wanted a little bit more from Jalen I th- you know Jalen was certainly undeniably the harder hitter out of the two in that show in, in that showdown um but whenever he had him hurt I don't feel like he stepped on the gas as much as he could have or should have uh, the other thing I would say is that Jalen is clearly massive for the division, but you can see the sacrifice that he, he has to take in his legs. His legs are very, very skinny, 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 skinny. And um, you can just see them snapping if he was to get a hard leg kick or something like that. Um, so I, w- I think he should consider moving up. But again, he says he says the only way is or walks around at 180, 183. So he's not too heavy for the division. But... Yeah, I just, I don't know, after last night, hmm, when you start talking about facing some of the top killers in the division, they they might find a better way to beat him. I don't know. We'll see how he comes back at the end of the day. He hasn't he hasn't lost the fight yet, so this is an interesting way to see see how he bounces back. Good luck to him as well. And well done to Mateusz Gamrot. Um, I heard someone mention, I think it was Bisping, maybe it wasn't, I can't rem- remember, um, that Mateusz will be back to fight uh, Fiziev versus, or the winner of Vizier versus Gaethje. Nah, he's losing that fight. So if he does come back, he's going to lose that one. Um, we'll see. Right, next up, fight of the night. 
Uh, Jeff Neal versus Shavkat Rachmanov. Um, not going to lie. <sighs> fight of the night. Maybe it was fight of the night, but I, w- <sighs> mm, yeah, I don't know, man. I don't know. Uh, looking back, it was a great fight, but I was a little bit disappointed in Shavkat. Um, for me, he got hit way too much. And he had a couple scary moments, particularly as the fight went on. He had a couple scary moments. Now, don't get me wrong. That finish was fucking violent. Very, 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 vi- very violent. And make sure you head over to Sofa Sensei's on Instagram because we're going to post that sh- picture at some point in the week to remind you of how violent that stoppage was. Horrible and great. And in a lot of ways, I've become a fan of, of Shavkat Rachmanov in the last week or so because of Laura Sanko and the way she's a huge, huge fan of Shavkat. She says um, he gives her chills, which, which you know, Shavkat is, uh, how do I put it? There was a picture posted with him and Laura at the end of the night. He won twice that night. Let's just say that. He won twice. Good on him. Um, but yeah, anyway, where was I going with that? Uh, yeah, Jeff Neal came in four pounds overweight. Um, at times, looked a bit sluggish, looked a bit fat on the night compared to how he usually looks. So I hope he's okay. I know we went through a few major illnesses with the sepsis and whatever else. Uh, so, yeah, I think I think it asked a lot of questions of Shavka. And it almost is reminiscent of Gilbert Burns versus uh, Hamzat Chimaev in that that was a test that Hamzat needed to go through in order to, to, first of all, answer a few of the questions that we have as a fan base and as Sofa Senseis and as armchair experts, but also for him to answer some questions himself. So Shavkat now knows that he has a chin. Now, I don't like necessarily fighters that lean too heavily on their chin. It, it cringes me out a little bit, particularly with my interest in the health of fighters now. But I get it. It's a fight sport. You don't go swimming and not get wet, and you don't have a fight and not get hit. And it's good to know that Shavkat can be hit and keep going and can ultimately pull out the win. He's, I think, 16-0 with 16 finishes now, so he's smashing it. He's doing his thing. Uh, well done to him. All right, moving on to the co-main event of the evening. Valentina Shevchenko versus Alexa Grasso. Now, a lot of people had no um by the way just 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 while I remember I don't think Shavkat Rachmanov beat Hamza Chimaev. Um yeah so a lot of people didn't give Grasso a chance. Uh, a lot of people I think ourselves included didn't even talk about Alexa Grasso in the lead up to this fight. Um it was all about Valentina securing the eighth um ruby on her title to complete the octagon which is which was her her vision, her goal and her, her aim. She didn't do that. She got choked out in the final round, I believe. And it was a vicious choke out as well. And, and so cleanly and, and, and quickly executed by Grasso. Now, Grasso clearly had the quicker and the sharper hands and the more well-refined hands of the two. But it was obvious as well that Valentina Shevchenko was the better, more well-rounded martial artist. But I had a massive fear. And if you head over to Aki and Saltfish on Twitter, uh, which is at Aki and Saltfish, um, I was tweeting all night about my concerns around Valentina. Her last fight against Santos wasn't an impressive performance. It was a risk, uh, a risk-laden performance where she was, in a lot of people's eyes, beaten or if not, given her toughest test. So for me, this fight was she is either on the slide, and this fight will prove that and compound that slide, or this fight will, uh, that last fight will motivate her, and we'll see that within this fight. Ultimately, she lost this fight. So, you know, it stands to the reason she was on the slide in her last fight. And this is just a continuation of that. Um, I don't think Valentina Shevchenko is bad. She's not bad. She's, she's you know, probably still the greatest of all time in terms of flyweight in women, the women's division. But what it does showcase is that for so, so, so long, she was ahead of the division. And then the division caught up with her. And then the prospects caught up with her. And people were training with her in mind. And then she wasn't so special anymore. And, and we saw that. Um, Grasso made and her corner made adjustments throughout the fight. Um, Valentina Shevchenko was a little bit hesitant at f- towards the first couple rounds uh, and did pull it out in the end, or did, did pull out that aggression in the end. But in a lot of ways, that aggression um, led to her telegraphing takedowns. When she did, th- when she did get takedowns, the shots she was throwing to me didn't look that hard. So I was was curious as to what was going on there. Um, you know, she was taking. A couple more risks, which is how she got caught in the end. She did the spin, uh, uh, attempted spinning back fist. Um, Grasso jumped on her back, got under her neck, got her hooks in, and then choked her out. And the, the choke was bloody vicious. You could see 
the marks on Valentina's face and, and the fact that her head went pink red, um, like it was about to pop off, w- w- was, was quite a sight as well, particularly when you factor in the finish before with Shavkat and Jeff Neal. Um, what happens next is probably a rematch. Um, and I think with a, a more improved game plan, I think Valentina Shevchenko can still win. But I don't think we're going to see Valentina Shevchenko as the champion much longer after that. Um, and I hope she retires on top because she deserves that sort of uh, send off and finish for her career. She's, she's, she's amazing. So, yeah, good luck to her. Um, and I'm sure we'll see a quick turnaround because Valentina won't want to sit on that loss for too long. But, you know, in any event, congratulations to a brand new um, strawweight champion as well. Viva la Mexico. Uh, Mexico's first female champion as well. It's worth noting. So shout out to her just before International Women's Day as well. So congratulations. Okay. Main event time. Let's read out some stats on John Jones. John Jones is the GOAT. Uh, the consensus greatest of all time um, now anyway. Before this fight, there was room for, for debate and room for, for questioning. But I think that is now out of the case. It is definite that John Jones is the best of all time. He has um, the youngest championship win in UFC history when he was age 23, 242 days old when he beat Shogun Hua for the light heavyweight championship. Talking of the light heavyweight champion, he has the longest uh, reign in that division's history. He is in the UFC Hall of Fame fight wing already for his fight against Alexander Gustafsson. He holds title wins over Alexander Gustafsson, Ryan Bader, Shogun Hua, Quinton Jackson, uh, Leo Tomachita, Rashad Evans, Vitor Belfort, Chael Sonnen, Glover Teixeira, Daniel Cormier. Twice. Oh, I suppose one of them's a no contest, but whatever. Um, he has 11 successful title defenses, which is tied for the most in UFC history. He is a two time UFC light heavyweight champion, 15 UFC title fight wins, and, and now the UFC heavyweight champion. Of the Bomba Clout World. <laughs> Super excited. Uh, look, like I said, I woke up early to make sure I caught that fight. Sometimes I just let my body wake me up and I'll catch like the, the start of the, the, the main event. But I wanted to, you know, really bask in this event centered around John Jones. Sorry if you're watching that. Um. <laughs> I I was a huge fan for the whole build up to this fight, watching the countdown, having debates in my barbers about John Jones being the GOAT or not. I couldn't believe people doubted that John Jones was the GOAT. Um, you know, people were saying to me that, you know, uh, he's not the GOAT because the guys he beat in the light heavyweight division were washed. And they weren't. Simple as that, they weren't. They were the best that the division had to offer at the time. Um I understood some people's concerns given John Jones' most recent performances, Anthony Smith, Thiago Santos, Dom Reyes, um, that he might not be able to pull out the bag. And, you know, three years out isn't good for anyone in, in that sort of uh, competitive sport where you need to be active. It's good for John Jones, though. John is different. John has a dog in him, he said in the in the one of the press conferences in Fight Week. He has a dog in him that he doesn't believe Cyril has. He doesn't believe... He can lose John Jones. He certainly doesn't believe he can lose someone as one-dimensional as Cyril Garn. He certainly doesn't believe he could lose to someone as inexperienced as Cyril Garn. And all those prophecies proved themselves to be true when John Jones stepped in the octagon last night. John Jones is an incredibly flawed man. Now, this is one of the debates we had in, in, the, in the barbershop that, you know, someone was saying they hope John Jones gets knocked out because he's a piece of shit human. I'm not here to debate John Jones's morality on this show in particular right here, right now. But I've got a few thoughts on this. First of all, yeah, cool. John Jones is certainly some sort of sociopath. I, I have no doubt of that. I don't think he feels empathy. I don't think he sees himself as someone who can or does do wrong at any point. So in a lot of ways, John Jones's career has been his worst enemy because he seems to have this natural predisposition to, to harming not only others but himself in and out of the octagon, symbolically and, and physically and emotionally and mentally. 
okay, you want a few examples, hit a pregnant woman's car, do the hit and run. Allegedly beat up his fiance. However many other DUIs and, 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 and poor decisions that have hampered his career and hampered his image. But, but, that same sociopathic energy that John Jones carries around with him is what makes him a fucking demon in the octagon. Al- well, literally unbeatable. Violent, merciless, calculated killer. That's what John Jones is. What makes him, I- in some people's eyes, a shit human, makes him a sick fighter. And greatest of all time isn't a test of morality, but is a test of fortitude, resilience, consistency, and talent in fighting. And John Jones have, has all of those in abundance because of his own personal character flaws. So it's a real fascinating thing to watch unfold every fight week when John Jones. I don't know whether it's a it's an act he tries to portray this 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 good guy image or whether he's really fighting his inner demons and and, it, and he's trying to suppress that side of him that is just reckless. But it's fascinating to watch because that gives John Jones an energy that no other fighter can match and has matched before. He's a demon, but he's a fucking talented demon. He is a goat. He's the greatest of all time without a doubt. He has a fantastic fight IQ, incredible level of confidence. And he's really calculated, and he plays some great mind games. Three examples I'll give you. First example is watching Embedded, and he sees Cyril Gunn laughing um, at th- while he was playing FIFA, enjoying himself. And John Jones talks down on him and says, you know, I heard you've got the top 60 um, pro teams in the world. I don't deal with that sort of shit. I'm training. I'm focusing on a fight. That's the difference between me and him. <laughs> love it. I love that shit talk from John. It's, it's that. You worried about that? Yeah. Look at you enjoying yourself. Fix up, man. This is a fight. Yeah, there's that. Second of all, Cyril Garn weighed in at 247 pounds uh, and a half. And John Jones weighed in after Cyril Garn, 248. Looking a little bit bloated. Now, you may look at that as a complete innocent coincidence. John Jones just naturally, well, not naturally, because obviously he put the weight on, but just coincidentally weighs more than Cyril Garn. I think John Jones waited to see what Cyril Graham would weigh, drank a lot of water to make sure he weighed more than him. Because the whole narrative going in before, Cyril Graham's a real heavyweight, Cyril Graham's going to be bigger than John Jones, how is John Jones going to prepare for someone who's bigger than him? And then the mind games continued um, after the fight as well. And I'll pick up one thing as well about that John Jones did in the pre-fight. But after the fight, um, John Jones, he said, after being asked a question about the French fans and do you feel sorry for them and are you sorry that you you know you ruined their dreams in a lot of ways, John Jones said no. This is a fight spot for it. Jesus Christ, man. Sorry, guys, I'm tired. John Jones said no. This is a fight sport. I don't feel sorry. I don't show any mercy. And on that note, mercy. Good night, guys. Mercy is in thanks in French after just beating a French guy and getting asked by a French reporter if he feels sorry for the French fans. Madman. Um, in that same press conference p- in the post-fight, John Jones says, uh, <laughs> he opens up with, Bonjour, ça va? <laughs> He's a troll. He's a mental troll. And I love it. I love it. I love that energy from John Jones, man. I like bad fighters. I don't mean bad as in not good. I mean bad as in, in a lot of ways, bad people. Because they're vicious. They're violent. They show no mercy. And they're great fighters. And they're, in a lot of ways, car crashes. And that's intriguing, as a soccer sensei, as a viewer. You you want to sort of see a bit of personality. No one likes clean cut a little bit too much, I don't think. That's me anyway, my own opinion. Right. The one thing I want to talk about in terms of pre-fight and John Jones and his, 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 his attitude towards that. He's very narcissistic. And again, that's a quality that makes him a great fighter and a, a pretty poor human in a lot of ways. Um, someone um, that he met at a fan meet and greet opened up to him about how he was battling um, leukemia for a little while uh, about three years ago 
took three years out of wrestling, came back and, and, and won a championship. And that was a really you know, touching, heartwarming story. And John Jones turned it around to him and he said, um, oh, so you can take three years out and come back and be a champion. I took three years out. Hopefully I'll be a champion. Now I understand a lot of people say, you know, you're just relating it back to, to a common ground and obviously they're there to meet John Jones and they know that he took three years out. He's not bringing it up out of the blue. And yes, I understand that, but it just struck me as a little bit narcissistic when the guy's opening up to John and John brought it back around to him. But I'm not asking John Jones to be a perfect human being. That ship has sailed. Um, I wish him the best. I wish him happiness, health and all of those things. But um, yeah, it was just interesting to observe. The fight game is full of weird, wacky and wonderful characters who have flaws in one aspect of their life but those same flaws make them excel in another. And that's what really captivates me as a as a viewer. So yeah, congratulations to John Jones. A stellar career. He could retire today and, 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 and that would that would be the icing on the cake. The fear, of course, is what does John Jones do next, both in the cage and out the cage. Um if he would have lost last night, that would have been almost like karmic retribution. In the sense that he's put a lot of bad things and hurt a lot of people in the world. And if he would just lose in the cage, maybe it would make him re- and force him to reflect. But because he keeps winning, it seems like everything that he does is the right thing to do because it works out in the end. As it happens, he obviously didn't get any karmic retribution in the cage. The most the most sort of obstructive things he got last night was one, forced to cut some tape off his foot before he got in the cage, which is a major distraction and would have thrown anyone off their game. And second of all, the first strike that he absorbed, and the only strike he absorbed last night, was a shot to the groin in the first 10 seconds. So, yeah. couple things to note about that whole fight before we move on. John Jones said he only sparred about three times in the lead-up to that fight because of, um, because of injury, which is quite interesting because it opens up some conversations about where he goes next and his striking did look a little bit sloppy, I'm not going to lie. So if you're fighting on more, I have to say, a more comprehensive striker, but how do you get a more comprehensive striker than Cyril Gahn in the heavyweight division? You sort of don't. But if you're fighting a more comprehensive fighter who can embed their striking a little bit better, someone like a Stipe Miocic, for example, what does that lead, what does that mean for John Jones? And in a lot of ways, that's really pertinent because John Jones' next opponent, somewhere around International Fight Week, if rumours are to be believed, is former heavyweight champion of the world and consensus heavyweight GOAT, Stipe Miocic. I'm not going to do a little buzzer there because you know what? When John Jones called out Stipe, Stipe looked shook. He looked old. He looked beat up. I don't think we're going to see that fight, really. And if we do, I don't think it's going to be anything more than a John Jones walkover. So, interesting. I think that's it. We covered the UFC. We covered boxing. What are your thoughts? For me, I think I'm still a little bit shocked. John Jones took three years out. He really, really is the greatest of all time. And for me, it's mind-blowing. I didn't grow up in any era where we saw the greatest of all time, really. Maybe Mayweather. But I caught the the tail end of, of Mayweather's career. And John Jones has been fighting, or been a champion since 2011. He's been fighting since 2008. He should be wrapping it up by now. But he's still going, and he's still top of the division. This is really a sight to see. And I think I'm most nervous about what John Jones did outside of the octagon between this and his next fight. Because it's very plausible that his next fight could be within his home, with the law, or something we haven't discovered yet. Time will tell. That has been the Sofa Sensei Sunday Sit Down. You've been joined by me, Caban, and this is the Aki and Saltfish Digital Network. I'm super pleased to say that. John Jones is the heavyweight champion of the world. Hey, listen, thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please don't forget to follow us on Instagram at Sofa Sensei and on Twitter at Aki and Saltfish. If you've got any questions for us, please don't hesitate to email Aki and Saltfish at gmail.com and we will read your question out live on the show and get back to you here and now. Um, listen, I really appreciate you watching. Please don't forget to like, comment and subscribe on this video or this podcast. It really would help us grow. If you are listening on a podcast platform, please share with a friend and don't forget to leave us a five star rating and review it helps us grow a lot thank you so much tomorrow 
we have a brand new episode of Before Our Friends Die coming out. Make sure you're tuning in for that. And if you want some more Sofa Sensei's content in your life, make sure you check out our previous episodes with Dom Felix, where we delve deeply into his career and then we get to know him with a short 10 minute episode. All in the archives. Check them out. Take care. See you soon. Goodbye.